Thank you for that invitation. Uh, uh, I'm here to talk about that third book of mine called Cheap Sex, Transformation of Men, Marriage, and Monogamy. Uh, the fourth book is coming out in August. It's entitled The Future of Christian Marriage. Uh, that's, it's where I've taken this and gone international to seven other countries. So I'm glad for the invitation to come here. Uh, as I said last night, I'm often told, great book title, but I don't actually want to be caught reading it anywhere. Uh, so it's, I want to take you on a brief tour of the book itself and what it talks about. It's a book about technology, three technologies in particular, contraception, digital pornography, and online dating, and how these three have radically altered how people form relationships and how those relationships transpire, whether they continue or whether they fold. It is a story of culture change, but also about like how technology has really been in the driver's seat of that culture change. In the prologue of his famous encyclical Humanae Vitae, Paul VI makes what is perhaps a pair of profound understatements. In fact, if you go through that, I keep thinking, wow, he just kept understating this stuff, and years later we see how it is uh, materialized. He observes that, quote, the recent course of human society and the concomitant changes have provoked new questions, unquote. And, quote, the changes that have taken place are of considerable importance and varied in nature, unquote. That's 50 years ago. The advent of hormonal contraception was only about uh, less than a decade old at that time. Its legal status in many places was still quite muddy. Fast forward 50 years, and we see evidence of so many kinds of changes, and I'm gonna talk about several of those. For the past decade, though, I've kind of been fixated on what is called sexual economics. Fixated might be a little bit too strong, but I, th I think it's a helpful set of tools to explain some of the behavior that I've been seeing in what has been called the mating market. Now, what is this mating market idea, okay? Well, it's invisible, it's a social structure, and it's where a search for a partner, whether somebody is pursuing a one-night stand or a marriage partner or something in between, it's that, uh, an invisible social structure where that search occurs. Mating market. When we think about mating market places, those are physical spots, particular locations where people actually try to meet other people. A gym, church, bar, the workplace, college. So I sometimes use the term mating pool and mating market interchangeably. I realize that this kind of talk can make some people nervous, anxious. It sounds utilitarian, sounds overly rational, very economic, unromantic, objectifying. It doesn't have to be those things. It simply recognizes that people do not meet other people randomly, nor do they meet whomever they wish and do whatever they want with them. There are always constraints which I think you all agree is a very good thing. Do I have a slide? Whoops, too far. This is the older classic mating pool. It's pretty basic, straightforward, simple. So let's start with the basics. Sex is, among other things, a social exchange. There is a basic exchange that typically precedes relationships, whether we're talking about marriage or the example of the one night stand. Men and women are typically seeking things from each other, and I'm afraid they're not always the same thing. That is actually good over the long run, and I'm not telling you something you don't already know. In the classic mating pool, the majority of paired sexual activity among unmarried persons was conducted in and during the search 
for a mate, someone to marry. Sex did not necessarily mean marriage, but relationship security was often a value and a precursor to sex. The pursuit of sex in this old classic mating pool meant risking pregnancy and the likelihood of subsequent marriage for a lot of people. Right? My maternal grandparents got married less than nine months before my uncle uh, appeared. At some point, when I was writing this book, I also watched the uh, series The Pacific. It's like the band of brothers, but on the other side of the world. Some of you have probably seen it, right? The last episode, right? When you're young and you're watching this, you just want the war. But like when you get older, you appreciate some of the, the less combat scenes. The last episode, which is they're going back to the United States, features the surviving characters returning home after battling on Okinawa. One returns to Alabama, and another returns to New Jersey. In each case, it becomes obvious to the viewers that regardless of the young men's wishes, marriage was considered the only intelligible way not simply to access sex, but to live your adult life. Culturally, in that era, marriage was in the cards, and these men, who had sacrificed so much on the battlefields of the Pacific, were going to have to sacrifice a little bit more in order to become considered marriageable by the women in their orbits. Women who protected and policed each other in the domain of relationships, something we don't see as much today. Then everything began to change with the advent and the uptake of contraception. You saw the last the mating market. This is the contemporary, split, imbalanced, modern mating pool. Contraception is not just another technology that delivers something common more efficiently, like the record player did with music, and then the iPod did. Rather, it's a technology able to prevent a socially and personally seismic event from occurring. Contraception did something new and unheard of in the realm of the private. It delivered access to desired pleasures without the historic anxiety over whether a sex act might unwittingly generate a new human being. Over time, the wide uptake of effective contraception split what was once a relatively unified mating pool into overlapping but distinctive sections or corners or even markets. One for sex, one for marriage, with a rather large territory in between comprised of significant relationships of varying levels of commitment and duration. We can put cohabitation right there in that middle. Hence, the mating market, the large pool of single men and women out there looking for company of some sort, just no longer functions in the way it once did. As young adults age, they drift towards the marriage corner of that market, meaning they more intentionally wish to pursue marriage and they intend for any sexual behavior they might display to serve that goal. But men and women are different, given their distinctive biological clocks, different preferences. Men and women tend to drift towards the marriage corner of the market at different paces on average. Men are slower to drift towards the mating or towards the marriage corner of the market than women. And that particular thing affects the power dynamics there profoundly. Now, maybe I shouldn't be talking about power dynamics, but I'm a social scientist, I deal with data, and I'm going to talk about what is real, and power in young relationships is a very real thing. Power within relationships is determined not simply by such things as inequalities 
in, say, physical attractiveness. We always hear about like, oh, she is way out of his league, right? Which is often true, but what that signals is that people look for different things in spouses. But it doesn't automatically mean that she has a lot more power than he does. There can be inequalities in social status, inequalities in income. But there's also inequalities in the surrounding market realities, like the availability of sex from other sources. The key is the level of a partner's dependency. It's about how much alternatives do you have access to? What happens when men are rare, as they are in the marriage corner of the market, or at least rarer, versus what happens if m women were rarer over there? What do men and women want? What are their preferences? Whatever their preferences, power flows to those that are rarer. Since they're rarer in the marriage corner of the market, men are apt to call the shots more. And even if particular men don't call the shots in their serious relationships, women who do tend to recognize that there's more at risk for her leaving than for him. Women talk about settling and whether they want to settle or not. Men typically don't talk about settling. The online, uh, the lingo of online dating often reinforces that split mating market. This is a, a screenshot from a, a short that we produced at the Austin Institute called The Economics of Sex. You can find it there, you can uh, find it on YouTube. The lingo of online dating reinforces this split mating market. People will say, uh, I'm looking for fun. No strings attached. Not into games. Ready for a real relationship. It signals your position in the mating market. And who says this, right? We have in this image a woman saying, I'm not into games. He's saying he's looking for fun. Like we're seeing different preferences in men and women. To women, all of this stuff comes across as confirming that men are afraid of commitment. I actually don't think men are afraid of commitment. The deal is that men are in the driver's seat in the marriage market because there are fewer of them in it and they can navigate the way they want to. That was not the case in the pre-pill mating market. All this means that people in the mating market are doing a great deal of educated guesswork about the intentions of any other particular person. They didn't have to do so much guesswork in the pre-pill mating market. It's an unsatisfying position to be in, especially for women. They feel like, is he duping me? Lots of people who are in the, the uh, online dating world experience this as deception, right? It was harder to deceive somebody in the pre-pill mating market. So what is the result of all this? The result is the title of that book, Cheap Sex. Now, what do I mean by cheap sex? Well, the, the definition of it is ease of access to desired sexual experiences, basically. Ease of access to desired sexual experiences. How do you measure that, right? That's my job, social scientist. So far as I can tell, this is the best measure of the price of sex. How long before sex is introduced into a relationship? Which essentially is how long until she permits a sexual relationship to begin because she is the gatekeeper and when men and women uh, have consensual relationships. It's not that long, as this slide shows. This is data from 15,000 random Americans, uh, or a random sample of Americans aged 18 to 60. The time to the commencement of sex with their current or most recent sexual partner, it could be your spouse, and in many cases it 
is their spouse. And you think, oh, it's, this is an age effect here. I split it by age, I see no notable difference in how this works by age. It sort of surprised me. One in three American women, and even more men, say that they had first sex in their current relationship, either before it was a relationship, or on the first day that they were in the relationship. The first day you met is rare, but for men it's above 5%. All the way over to after we got married, which remains at about 10%, that doesn't signal that 10% of all Americans were uh, virgins when they got married. Um, that just means that 10% of all couples marrying uh, had sex after they got married, the first sex in that relationship. Now, it's hard to imagine a high share of pre-relationship first sex in my grandparents' generation. I can't imagine if we did this back in 1929 that we would see something similar to this. It wouldn't be all lopsided on the right, but it would certainly be heavier on the right than on the left. Why? Well, because sex risked pregnancy then far more than it does today. You combine that with the availability of abortion, and here we are. Switching gears to a different kind of technology. This is the percent of Americans reporting pornography use, intentional pornography use, I asked about it in a particular way, in the past week, technically it's past six days, split by age, men on top, women on bottom there, 43% of adult men, if you pool it all, say that they have used pornography in the past six days. And the, the, the figures with the women are not noticeably, uh, I mean, they're not zero by any stretch. Now, why care about this, and why am I linking it to uh, cheap sex? For lots of reasons, but I want to focus on an overlooked one. The dynamics of uh, relationship formation. Because I tend to look at this uh, less as a, an individual problem, which is, it still is, it's real. But I, a sociologist, I look at like, what is the social problem here? If pornography satisfies some of the male interest and demand for sex, right? speaking like an economist, then it may well reduce the total demand for her own sexual expression, what she uniquely offers. And as a result, the price she can expect to obtain will be lower. It sounds very crude to speak about this, but there's a reality in there. Pornography diminishes women's sexual confidence and security. She perceives it as competition. She'll say, I can't compete with that. I can't look like this woman on the screen. Well, so what is she saying? She's saying it is competition. What do we know that competition does to prices? It drives them down. The maddening thing here is that she hasn't done something wrong, but ironically, more relationship power then flows in his direction because he has more options than he used to. Men interpret this a little bit differently. They tend not to think of it as cheating. They think, oh, this is competition for my monogamous attentions. She wants your monogamous behavior. So we treat it, typically speaking, as individual problems. This woman is angry at this man, wife to husband, girlfriend to boyfriend. And I'm trying to focus on like, what's the social problem here? How does this affect sort of the marriage market in general? Unfortunately for women, they get stuck in what I call a pornographic double bind. It's kind of a catch-22 of sorts. 
Breaking off a relationship because of pornography can seem like a rational and moral reaction to someone's predilection for peering at sex online. But if we take a step back, we also recognize that that too contributes to the broader retreat from marriage and stable relationships that is going on, which many of us claim to be concerned about. If such a man is by definition off limits, well then a high percentage of women will not find themselves in a relationship at all. And of course, the remaining men out there who aren't looking at pornography become really rare, and what happens to those who are rare? Power flows to them. This is the pornographic double bind, wherein women find themselves stuck between two unhappy scenarios, the unwanted porn use of the man they are with, the elevated odds of the same among the person they might leave them for, and the risk of being alone. On to the third technology that I cover in the book, online dating as price suppressor. Okay, Mark, we get it. Contraception we may be ambivalent about, pornography, who's gonna support that? Online dating, lots of people meet on online dating. People in this room have met that way. Why pick on this, right? Well, I'm not here to say it can't be used well, okay? It can. But it, fundamentally, there is a bargain hunting nature to the thing which causes many problems. So how does, how does it work and what's the problem? Basically, it's about the speed and efficiency, right? It fosters an emphasis on what traits can we discern immediately, right? What are these traits? The physical maybe symbols or signals of socioeconomic status, perhaps. And efficiency. Online dating magnifies or intensifies the emergent challenges of the mating market, right? Human beings are not meant to be cycled through efficiently and quickly. Another thing that it tends to do is it diminishes our interest in solving what we used to call upfront investment costs, right? Solving problems. I'll give you an example that I talk about in the book. Um, I met my wife in college, 1989, pre, I don't know if it was pre-internet, pre my access to the internet, well before the era of online dating, right? Small college, uh, we started dating fairly early, didn't feel like I had lots of options out there, which people now see they do in online dating. We went through lots of relationship turmoil. She broke up with me once because I was being distant and cold. Um, she went promptly to the Chicago Auto Show with a, sort of a competitor of mine, so I perceived. I had an assignment due in my uh, psychology course and I had to watch One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest on a Friday night by myself in the dorm. Which, if you've seen that, it's kind of a, one can start thinking of themselves as going a little bit insane. So by Monday, we were back together. But the, de the deal is, I didn't even know if I had other options, right? There was one other girl who's, you know, she was kind of interested in me, but it's like, I had a lot of water under the bridge. I, I had a lot invested in this relationship. Am I ready to walk away? Friends of mine lately sort of realize, oh, if this date doesn't go well, okay, you look online for who's, who's interested in you. That didn't exist 30 years ago, right? Would my behavior with regard to my wife be different today because of that? I don't know. It's a counterfactual. I didn't live it. Possible. And online dating, too, doesn't really give more control to women than to men, right? If any of you are familiar with the advent of Bumble, right? It's a company based in Austin where I live. People think, ah, this is it. Women have control here. They start the conversation. But take a step back, okay? It, it helps a little bit. But like, take a step back. 
the advent, the, the, the perceived need to start the company signals that here too, men are dominating the field. Online dating, I realize, can be used for good. I have no problem admitting that. What cannot really be reformed about it is its underlying logic. It privileges the physical rather than the whole person. It privileges speed rather than methodically getting to know someone. I mean, think about the image of somebody just cycling through pictures, swiping left, swipe, left, left, right, left. I mean, it's like, how are we treating human beings like this? You can counteract that, I know, and some of you have done that successfully, but it takes work to do so. It is not its logic. Speed and efficiency, too, are consonant with the hookup. Hookups are about speed and efficiency. It's about a short-term mentality to relationships. And nor do they foster the will to work through problems. Now, some hold that all this talk about exchange is too secular, too utilitarian. I mean, where is love in this, Mark? You haven't mentioned that word yet. In reality, the exchange relationship between men and women is commonly cloaked in and operating alongside various cultural narratives and scripts. And it's often augmented with romance and bona fide love. So despite what it may seem, I do believe in love. I also believe in supply and demand market forces. I believe in sacrifice but I also know that ulterior motives can operate in men, being one myself, and it can also operate in women. I also believe we have witnessed shifts in cultural narratives about marriage, permissive acts, and the presumption of fertility control. John Paul II called this the contraceptive mentality, the assumption that sex is by nature infertile. That's just a, that's something that human beings never used to be able to think. While I may not sound romantic, you can check various Christian catechisms on marriage. They are not chock full of romantic accounts either. So this is hardly an unchristian account. And besides, men and women continue to make use of economic signaling that highlights the reality of the exchange model. That has not disappeared. One author noted that previously, yes, bride and groom met in the family living room, think of other countries, money passed from hands of one father to another. We get it. Today though, courtship is done in bars and cafes. We're still passing money on to people from hands of lovers to waitresses. More money is transferred to the bank accounts of fashion designers, gym managers, and dietitians, he said. That author is right. Relationships are still brokered. Resources are still being expended. While American fathers and mothers often have little to do with whom their children today, they haven't for quite some time. Online dating is an extremely blunt tool People assess the gain in trade they would make for just going out on one date with a person. If anything, think about it, the modern mating market is far more nakedly economic, far less social, far more dehumanizing than the pre-pill era. There's little sheltered offered anyone Every man and woman seems like they're now on their own. She's hoping for dignity and respect, but she's not sure she can get it. What is gone now is a sense of interdependence, leaving us independent. We are more free by definition, but we're also far more vulnerable than many of us would wish to acknowledge. That old era is gone, it's deconstructed by the uptake of contraception. 
There was a trade-off. It had consequences. This new world of partnering now is apt to lead to frustration, anxiety, confusion, regret, more visible power plays between people. All of it fertile soil for the kind of ambiguity that leads people to now ask, what is it that we just did? Ambiguity and regrettable sex in turn give birth to questions about genuine consent at all. Now where does this leave us? Pope Paul VI spoke about human beings, especially young, needing incentives to keep the moral law. He said that in Humana Vitae. Needing incentives to keep the moral law, right? Economic language. But now we see men and women need incentives even to marry at all. We're seeing a one percentage point decline for 40 years now in marriage among 25 to 34 year olds, kind of this historic sweet spot of getting married, started in 1970. We often think of the sexual revolution as the 60s. They didn't radically affect uh, relationship patterns, but there's something that sociologists call cultural lag, where it takes a while for the effects of technology to catch up with normative behavior. And that starts in 1970 and continues to today. It is one of the greater ironies in economics and public policy that our leaders continue to press for greater and greater access to fertility control at the same time that economists worry that our labor force is going to be too small. But it actually highlights one of the most common situations in the study of sexual behavior and family decision making. We know the empirical evidence looks kindly upon self-control, hard work, delayed gratification, stable marriage, monogamy. We know the data looks favorably upon them. And yet everywhere we tend to see law and policy being tailored towards alternatives, towards options without even so much as lip service being paid to what might be called best practices. I mean, what industry or domain of life do we do that in where we are not concerned with best practices? Paul VI said, another effect that gives cause for alarm is that a man who grows accustomed to the use of contraceptive methods may forget the reverence due to a woman reduce her to being an instrument for the satisfaction of his own desires, no longer considering her as his partner, for whom he should surround with care and affection. I get it. Contrast that narrative to Kevin's, somebody we interviewed for the book. He's a 24-year-old. We talked to him in Denver. This is Kevin's lingo. Girls are more emotional than guys. Simple as that. Girls get attached more. Girls are easier to mislead than guys just by lying or just not really caring. If you know what girls want, then you know that you should not give that to them until you see the proper time. And if you do that strategically, then you can have, really have anything you want, any way you want it, any form you want it, whether it's a relationship, sex, or whatever. You have the control. That's what Kevin told us. Kevin sounds like a jerk. But it's hard to tell him that his strategy will not work because it has for him and it has for many others. In light of comments like that, Paul VI's claim about the church can make not only religious sense, it starts to make just rational, defensible sense even apart from religion. He said the church is convinced that she is contributing to the creation of a truly human civilization. She urges man to, but not to betray his personal responsibilities by putting all his faith in technical expedience, unquote. Technical expedience. What has happened in the domain of sex and human relationships is nothing short of a concerted accomplishment of technology 
in the service of human consumption and objectification. Sex is cheap. It is more widely available at lower cost to all than ever before in human history. What has emerged is not at all unlike the decline of the locally owned boutique shops and the rise of big box discount chains. Cheap sex has been mass produced with the help of two distinctive means that have little to do with each other, the wide uptake of the pill and mass produced high definition pornography and then made more efficient by our growth in communications technologies. They drive the cost of sex down, making real commitment more expensive and challenging to navigate. These three things have created a massive slowdown in the development of long-term relationships, especially marriage. They've put women's fertility at risk, driving up demand for infertility treatments. And they've taken a toll on men's marriageability, but not on men's power in relationships. This new regime is becoming the norm today in the West. It's the template for evaluating relationship development. And it has changed how men and women perceive themselves, their sexuality, each other, and the very point of relationships. Cheap sex does not make marriage unappealing. It just makes marriage less urgent and it makes marriage more difficult to accomplish. Meanwhile, the more organic citizens in our midst, those of us who are more skeptical about the boundless promises of the sterile and undisciplined life, we're increasingly portrayed as restrictive, misogynistic, backwards. Among the many ironies that greet us in the domain of human sexuality, this is one of the most profound. But classical sexual restraint, typically more the product of social rather than personal control, has always fostered a future orientation that dovetailed well with the productive life. I'm not gonna offer wistful elegies for earlier eras. They all had their problems, and there's no creating new winners without new losers, and there's no going back. This should not surprise any of us. This matters, though, for the church because of a critical mass of people ever successfully snubs relationship commitment, permanence, sexual exclusivity, and it's a possibility, given enough time, it's gonna become really difficult for a minority of us to do otherwise. In the next book, I explore this theme further, and I conclude that it matters for Christians what other people in their environment are doing. Cheap sex was a trade-off. In its wake, human sexuality has become anything but natural and green. Once something that belonged to the physical world, sexuality is now increasingly characterized by a postmodern dualism. You have your consumptive, malleable body housing the essential self. The ancients would not have thought of that this way. Our grandparents would not have thought of it this way. The route to marriage, something the majority of young Americans still hold as a key goal, is more fraught with years and failed relationships than in the past. Once familiar narratives about romance and marriage, how to date, how do you fall in love, what does it look like when you're falling in love? Who should you marry? When should you marry? These are no longer widely affirmed. It's creating a great deal of consternation among young adults about how they should move forward. They ask me for advice, but this is a social problem, not a personal problem. Right? I don't have a ton of advice to give, 
but I do have some pieces of general advice and things to remember. First, people need to see these realities clearly and early. Second, gatekeeping reflects women's authority and power, not their powerlessness. Third, you are owed bodily integrity, security, and dignity. People shouldn't think of it as like this is a negotiable. Fourth, expect and then voice your expectations about good conduct and do it early in a relationship. Fifth, this might not fit well with everybody in this place, I think young adults should dance. Different kinds of dance. Why do I think that? Because they need to get to know the other sex, right? And dancing is a form of sensual, non-sexual touching. It's actually very formative for people, right? I think. I didn't do it growing up. Dutch Calvinist, sorry. But my kids did, now as Catholic converts. Um, and I think it's been good for them. Sixth, in the dating process, I think you should demand physical proximity, right? This is tough for young adults, right? They're like, they want to handle things by text, okay? Texting is for old married people like us, right? No, but in a relationship is, is young, there's lots of room for misinterpretation. You should demand physical proximity as you get to know someone. Seventh, parents, be a little bit wary about too many boundaries. I know we're worried about our kids, but there is a thing called setting too many boundaries when you're actually trying to get people to learn how to navigate members of the opposite sex. Eighth, women, if you want someone to ask you out and it's not happening, right, I actually think that you should inform them that you would say yes if they did. Sometimes men just need a little suggestion. Men are lacking confidence today for lots of reasons. And if you're going to wait for them, you might wait permanently. If, you just, if you're afraid of the answer, I'm sorry. But if you want an answer, inform them. I'd go out with you if you asked me. It's not that forward. and You actually didn't do the asking. You're just informing. Ninth, ninth, and finally, do not tolerate, especially men, men don't tolerate boorish or poor behavior on the part of your friends. Women can also do this as well. Because if we don't teach them, who's going to teach them, right? One thing I've noticed today is people don't police each other in this domain very well. I'll have roommates uh, at University of Texas, students will be, they'll talk about their roommates who act decidedly different than they do, uh, very permissive in the domain of uh, sexuality and sex. And I keep, I, uh, t t I'll say to them, like, you realize they're, they're kind of your mortal enemy, right? And they're like, I don't get that, right? Because they are teaching the men in their world what it takes to be with a woman. You think that's, you disagree, but like, she's free to do that. Like, you should perceive them as being opponents, not just sort of, oh, they act differently than I do. All right. I'm going to close there. I'll take some questions, and uh, I'm very grateful to Cleveland White Drive for the, for the invitation. Thank you. All right. Fantastic. Man, I was taking notes like crazy over there, and I can't wait to go home and tell my church it's okay to dance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, these are the questions I'm supposed oh, to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do gonna it. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, right. We're going to do this like we're on TV, like we are, live TV. Again, we're being streamed. There's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, most of the questions came into two categories, and one is I was just at an addiction recovery center last week, and they were talking about pornography and its yeah. addictive qualities. Yeah. Uh, any, uh, how important is it for pro-life or pro-family efforts to focus on how do you diminish porn? And with that, maybe piggyback on some of the other questions, like how is this affecting sex and marriage? 
relations, everything from right. erectile dysfunction to right. are people, right. does it help your marriage at all? No. That was quick. Um, <laughs> yeah. At the same time, I'll be quick about the other one. I think the erectile dysfunction thing is a, 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 a tiny minority of cases. And so we can have a predilection for hearing the extremes. Um, I actually ask that question in interviewing people uh, for, for the book project. And, and this were young adults. So a few of them heard of some other people, but like none in their, in their immediate orbit or themselves felt they had a, a problem with that, right? So I think it's, it's over this dysfu erectile dysfunction thing. I don't think it's as prominent as people uh, make it out to be. All right, so but there's other questions in there I'm, I'm already well, missed. In terms of helping your sexual relationship, people, I mean, that's right. one of the, you know, you need to yeah. splice up your relationship, no, 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 and no, you're saying it does not help. No, not, I mean, uh, I, I can't say for everybody, but like in the, in the Christian community, this is not wise, right? And it doesn't help, in part because, so, here, if, 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 whose idea is that, by the way, right? I mean, it would, it would be introducing a get more male power into your marriage, right? When marriage should be kind of the end of this sort of power dynamics that is sort of typical to early relationships, kind of who has the upper hand, who wants the relationship less, right? Marriage, it's, you know, it's not supposed to be like that, right? Well, you add pornography back in and all of a sudden, she has lost power. Right? Because now he has other options and tacitly he's suggesting, oh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if you acted more like this? Mm -hmm. Because he is adding ease of access for himself, right? And saying the problem is with you. The problem is not with her. So. And, and it's not real. Right, right, it's not real. All the airbrushing, there's no bad breath. However, no like, <laughs> I agree, but like, it, it's, it's perceived as real, yes. right? And so it's real in its consequences, very sociological notion, right? We can say it all, all we want that, oh, that's fake, but like, uh, if it was so fake, why are so many people enamored of it? Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, we've got about two minutes or one more. Again, all the questions, some great ones over there will be uh, addressed uh, as later Mark will be with... Uh, Molly on the, from the median, in the media, from the median on the radio program. So a lot of good stuff. But the, 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 trend, the trends of not being married and upholding marriage, mm -hmm. is this yeah. uh, in developing countries or undeveloped? Is it across the board? Is it the same in Europe? And, wh uh, and, and where yeah. do you see this in 15, 20 years? <laughs> right, right. That's a good pitch for my next book, which is, uh, looks at the future of marriage. It's a study of young adult Christians, Catholics, Pentecostals, Evangelicals, Orthodox in... Uh, United States, Mexico, Poland, Spain, Russia, Lebanon, Nigeria. Wow. Yes, it is happening elsewhere. The, the kind of, I mean, everybody, almost everybody felt like sex was easy. We asked them that question, right? It didn't mean that they were engaged, but they felt like this was something that everybody had access to. So, uh, yes, it's happening elsewhere. Um, it, but part of that book has good ideas, right? Chapter six is about like, Things I learned elsewhere that can be helpful. That comes out from Oxford in August, Future of Christian Marriage. Your second question was? Now, where do you see this in 15, 15, 15 years? 15 years. Okay, well, so I, I conclude in the book uh, with some predictions. Uh, sex is not going to get more expensive anytime soon. However, I mean, I, I, I think we, we don't want to, 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 to encourage this or rush into this. I mean, I'm not a doomsday kind of person. Right? Marriage is not going to go away. I say that in both books. Um, but I think it, it, it'll, it gets slimmer before it gets better. Right? Uh, one of the things that make Christianity and attractive is like how we tend to treat each other. Right? And when you have lived enough of this sort of consumptive relationship, I think people can get tired of that. They do get tired of that. And so it, Christianity often holds out a different vision of what caring for one another and, and faithfulness should look like. Excellent, excellent. Hey, well, show your appreciation to Mark again. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll get more of these questions on the radio program. Thank you so much.